Hello from Duluth, Georgia, Agco's world headquarters, and welcome to the Heston VIP virtual experience. Well, I tell you, I wish we could be in person like we have in the past, but circumstances this year were beyond our control, and while the world is kind of crazy. But I'm excited to share with you virtually a VIP experience for the Heston by Massey product offering that we have here this year. During this virtual tour, you'll get up close and personal to our production process and our machines, more close than you ever could have been in person. And we're excited to share that experience virtually with you today as we tour our world-class facility in Heston, Kansas. As you're aware, Heston by Massey Ferguson is a world leader when it comes to hay products. With over 2,100 patents and counting, and over 50 years of experience of listening to you, the farmer, and taking your input and adding it into our innovative designs to continue to develop world-class hay products. Hi, welcome to Heston. My name is Seth Byteen. I'm the site director. Here in Heston, we've been producing ag equipment since 1947. We produce everything from large square balers, small square balers, windrowers, and the headers that go on them. In Heston, we represent a proud legacy of hay equipment. We'll take the opportunity to show you just a little bit about how we accomplish that. On behalf of the 1,200 people that work here in Heston, designing, producing, and supporting the ag industry, and hay equipment especially, we appreciate you stopping by. Thank you again for your time today. And thank you for your commitment and support of Heston by Massey Ferguson and our many innovative hay products. We've got a lot of exciting things left to show you here today, so I hope you enjoy the tour. Hi, I'm Matt LaCroix. And I'm Dane Mosel. Welcome to Heston VIP, virtually. Each year we invite customers and guests to come to Heston, Kansas, tour our factory and see all of our great world-class equipment. Unfortunately, this year we couldn't invite guests here, so we're doing the next best thing. We're gonna take you on a factory tour and walk you around all of our great equipment. Welcome to Heston, Kansas, Haytown, USA. Here I am on the finished goods lot. Beside me here is a 9300 series rotary disc header. One of the most important parts of a disc header is the conditioner. We're going to follow the steps it takes to make this conditioning roll, as well as many other products built here in Heston, Kansas, the large square baler, small square baler, round balers, more conditioners. 90% of the parts that we use are produced right here on site in Heston, Kansas. Now let's take you all the way back to the beginning. Most of the equipment that we build here at Heston starts its life in one of these coiled steel rolls behind me. Let's follow the process as we uncoil it and flatten it out into a sheet which later gets cut by the laser. These steel rolls weigh anywhere from 15 to 18 tons. The 20 ton crane that is overhead picks up each one of these rolls and loads it into the spool that is on the uncoiler. steel comes off the coil, it runs through a set of forming rolls and dies to flatten the sheet before it is then sheared into a certain length for the tables of the lasers. get their sheets of steel in pre-cut dimensions. The benefit of what we do here is that we can cut the sheets to whatever size works best for our manufacturing purposes. Behind me is one of the many lasers that we use here at the manufacturing facility. The benefit of using a laser is that we can cut 
parts very quickly and that we have a nice clean square edge versus a deformation or a curve that you would get out of a plasma for shearing the parts. This laser automatically feeds itself from this tower rack behind me and once the parts are done, it automatically unloads them after cutting. This means that this laser can run 24-7 by itself. laser and these sheets have cooled, this is the area where we take all the individual parts out of the skeleton as we call it and organize them into these bins. We have thousands of parts on site and the way we keep track of them is these tags. Each one of these tags says what the part is by its part number, how many are in this bin and where its location is at on the facility. Of the 30,000 parts that are required to make the large square balers, wind rowers, round balers, small square balers, and mower conditioners, 90% of them we make here in-house. A press brake takes a flat sheet of steel and forms it into the desired shape that it needs to be for the next assembly. One of the neat features of the brake that is behind me is that it is a CNC brake, which means it's computer controlled. The operator does not need to know how far to set the back gauge and how far the ram needs to come down for every single break. The computer does it for them and they simply have to hold the part square and move it in and out. Now we're in plant three. We will mainframes and sub-assemblies here, so let's take a tour through the plant. There are 13 sub-assemblies being performed behind me here. They go into our rotary disc headers. They're welding together the rotary head mainframe. From here, it goes to final weld, then to paint. world-class Heston large square balers begin their life here. As you can see behind me, these are going to be the sides of the mainframe of a large square baler. Now let's follow that process. Large Guard Baylor Axle Subframes.
see a mainframe of a large square baler. All of our precision welding is done by hand. But when we have high volume welding, we move it over to the robotic welders. for large square balers. As you can see, the baler starts coming together and it starts resembling a large square baler. After this point, it moves on to paint. Our industry leading small square balers are built right here. This is where the frame assembly happens. As you know them, they come in different model numbers, 1848, 12-propelled wind roll frame is starting to take shape. This might look a little funny to you, but this is a self-propelled wind roller frame turned upside down. You can actually see where the planetary hubs are. After this point, it goes to final weld and then out to paint. In the machining factory, we're gonna show you a few different processes here today. We're gonna to show you where our condition roller gets started and other items such as a world-class double knotter system. The double knotters are built here in-house, as you can see behind me here, and they have been since 1978 when Heston invented the double tight knotter system and the large square baler. Some parts here at the Heston factory, such as the large square baler knotters, need to be heat treated. This will make them very strong and reliable. Here you can see the process happen. What we refer to as the kahuna, this is where our condition roll really gets its shape and its start in life. We're actually welding on the end bars to connect it to 
the frame of the header. We have the smaller condition rolls over here that will go on some of the pull type mower conditioners. If you'll follow me over here, you'll notice these are much bigger. These will be conditioning rolls that are going to go onto your 16 foot and 13 foot headers. Now we're going to look at the process of them welding the cleats onto the conditioning rolls. roll for a self-propelled wind roller, this is where the cleats are being welded on. They weld, twist, and form that chevron style you know. When you really want quality hay, this is where it starts. The cleats on conditioning rolls have to be bent and welded very precisely because they have to intermesh together as the roll spins at very high speeds. This results in a high quality crimp. The assembly process for our razor bar cutter bar happens right here behind me. The first cutter bars in the world with a three-year factory warranty. The razor bar cutter bar, as you can see, is modules. We only have those modules for ease of making different sizes here in the plant. There's never any reason to break those modules apart to do any kind of maintenance. We're here in the small square baler assembly section for the gearboxes. We're actually assembling an 1844S, which is a three-stream baler gearbox right here behind me.
inside a flywheel balancing station here. This flywheel goes on a 2270XD large square baler. You can tell that by the shape of it. This is 1,100 pounds. You want to make sure it's super balanced. And you'll see as he slowly spins this around, similar to what you do with your truck tires when you balance them, he'll take weight out of the flywheel to make sure it's balanced. Welcome to our paint facility here in Heston, Kansas. There's only two other facilities like this in the world. One's owned by Mercedes, the other one's Audi. Here, we're at the dip tanks for our e-coating process. There's 15 different processes to go through here before it actually gets to the e-coating. Throughout this factory, you'll see us show e-coating, powder coating, and wet paint. Now you see the rotary header coming out of the e-coat bath. Each piece that comes through our paint facility gets dipped 15 different times in 15 different tanks. Our engineers not only have to design the best head equipment in the world, but they also have to think about the little things. Drainage. All that material and liquid that's coming out of one tank to the next so that it doesn't contaminate the next tank has to drain out. just seen is our 15-step eco process. Here's the way the chart looks. You can see it goes through pickling process, clean water, acid baths, etc. Final step of the eco process after it comes out of the 15 tanks is to go into the oven to bake on the eco. There are two baking processes, one after eco and one after powder coat. Here, you can see the large square baler frame going into the powder coat booth. 90% of the powder coat is applied by automatic spray nozzles. We also have painters in the booth for the precision work. has come through the entire eco process. Now it's going to go through the powder coating process and get the Massey Ferguson red paint put on it. After the powder coat process, the pieces go into the oven for the baking. Once the pieces and parts enter the paint plant, they're hung from rails and transported from one section to the next by robots, cranes, and rails, all controlled by computers. In some sections of the plant, rails are stacked high in five vertical layers with all the parts moving in different directions.
now that we've cut, broke, welded, machined, and painted all the components, we are now here in final assembly for each of the primary lines. Behind me is the wind rower tractor line, and we will go down this step by step. This frame may look familiar as we saw it earlier being welded together in the time lapse video. Of the 30,000 parts that we build on site, 75 of them come together and become one part, which is why it still has its own tag. As the frame gets completed in each station, there's a track in the floor that the carts roll along and move to the next substation. In the first station, it's much easier to see the glide rider axle as it gets installed here with the two shocks and the coil spring that's in the center. From this station here to the next station, we see a big change as the engine and pump stack assembly is put in. Over here on the side of the assembly line in the sub-assembly station, we see the Agco Power 7.4 liter engine being assembled with the pump gearbox and pump stack as it's ready to be installed over on the main assembly line. Once the engine and pump stack assembly has been set into the frame, the hydraulic hoses, motors, and accessories get bolted into place. the hydraulic and fuel tanks are installed over top of the hydraulic pumps and hoses that have already been routed. And then the electrical components, such as the controllers, are bolted into place and all the electrical harnesses are hooked up. Next goes on the top frame and the V-Cool cooling package. Behind me is a vision cab that's getting ready to be set on the wind rower frame. Our in-house welded cab frames start here and then move down through the process. Next we install the back glass, seat, trim, and steering column. Now we are ready to put the cab top on. Inside the cab top is the wire harness for the lights and the air conditioning unit. put the windshield, the side glass, and the door glass on. moving into the run-in station, they first off get filled with hydraulic oil, diesel fuel, DEF, coolant, and engine oil. Over here, we're placing it on the dyno. We will check the hydraulic pumps and motors to ensure that they are working properly. This is also the first time the engine will be started in the wind rower.
Lisa Winderor has successfully passed run-in station. It now comes out here to get the side shields, end cap, decals, and tires installed. Seven times a day, one of these beautiful machines rolls off the line. Behind me is a rotary header frame, which we saw the time-lapse video of earlier welding it together before it went to paint. I'm especially fond of this piece of equipment as I design many of the components that go into it. Once the header frames are set on the line trolleys, then the conditional rolls start to get put in. we can get a close-up view of the turbulence reduction roll and the Heston standard steel-on-steel -steel conditioners. Also in this station, we install the high-flow augers. After the cutter bed is installed, the header is then laid down to finish the assembly process. This is the station where we install the hydraulic motors, gearboxes, condition roll drives, and the start of the hydraulics. Once all the primary drives have been installed, the main hoses that connect to the window or tractor are put on. After all the gearboxes and drive lines have been put in, we now put all the hydraulic hoses on. Every rotary header must pass a quality check before it goes on and goes out of the building. Behind me is the run-in station where we test electrical functions, hydraulic functions, and actual running of the header. The run-in machine fills the hydraulic lines as well as checks all the electrical components. After the run-in station, the rest of the shields are installed on the header. The last step in building a rotary header is putting it in its shipping crate and tipping it back up. The reason we ship them standing up is so that we can stack two side-by-side -side on a standard semi-bed.
where the world famous Heston Large Square Baylor starts its life. The first primary components that get installed to the mainframe are the Optiform chamber doors and then the plunger. work platforms, we can easily see the plunger and main gearbox before the connecting rods have been installed. Now we can start to see some of the drives being installed on the outside of the frame. see the needle carriage with all six of the needles for a 3x4 baler installed. And here's a completed knotter stack ready to be installed on the large square baler. installed the knotter stack and connected the needles as well as put the front tension gears on we are ready to move to the next station We've now lifted the baler up so that we can slide the axle subframe in and underneath. Now we have installed the wheels, the rest of the drives, the stepper chute, and the pickup onto the mainframe. We can install the hydraulic tank and all the shield substructures. Here we thread the baler with twine and run it through a couple cycles to check all the knotter functions and ensure we're getting proper knots. we've completed checking all the functionality of the baler, we will finish it off by installing the twine boxes and the rest of the outer shielding.
all the shields and handrails go on, there's one final quality check that happens before the bailer goes out the door. Now let's follow along the assembly process of the world's best-selling small square baler. In the first station, we install the tires, the packer, and the basic hay dogs. The hay dog is the component of the baler that keeps the bale flakes compressed when the plunger makes a stroke. Next, we install the gearbox and the plunger into the chamber. in the process is installing the needle, carriage, and the knotter stack on top of the baler. As we continue on down the line, the electrical harness and many of the drive chains get installed on their sprockets. assembling the 1842 small square baler. They come factory standard with hydraulic bale tensioning. It is also optional on the 1840. The next process is to put the pickup unit underneath the baler. Once the shields and twine boxes have been installed, we can then move on to putting the front drive line together. As with all of our products, before it rolls out, we do one final check to make sure that everything works perfectly before it gets to you.
round baler line. Let's follow this process from where we have a bare frame all the way to completed baler. First, the baler is set onto the trolley that will help transport it down the line as it is being assembled. In the first station, the PTO gearbox and the wheel spindles are put on the baler. Next, as we can see, we move along. We start assembling the rollers into the frame. Next, the twine arm and tension rack are installed inside the frame. Next, the tailgate and its rollers are installed onto the baler. On the front side of the same station, the hydraulics have started to be installed. This station, the hydraulics are completed and we start to install the shielding around the front of the baler. This is the station where the baler starts to really take shape, where we install the belts and finalize all the rollers. The wedge grip belts with alligator splicings that we use make these belts very flexible but yet very strong. The texture on these wedge grip belts is what makes them perform so well in bringing the hay into the baler and forming a dense and concise bale. In this next station is where we put the large flotation tires that are factory standard on our baler. Now that we've put all the parts together on the baler, we will make sure they function correctly. We do this by hooking the baler up to a run-in station which simulates a tractor. It has electrical and a PTO as well as hydraulics. So we will actuate the tailgate, run the baler, make sure all the belts and rollers turn, as well as that all the electronics work for the lights and the sensors. The assembly line can only function if it is supplied continuously with all the pieces and parts they need. This is done by a fleet of forklifts. Just as in your grocery store, each location on the entire site of Heston has a code. Each forklift has a computer monitor that tells the driver which pallet or part to collect and where to take it. Once the final checks and quality controls have been made, the headers and windrowers are loaded onto trucks to be transported. The headers are placed vertically on wooden frames and then secured with chains. Windrowers are driven onto the back of the trailer and then their wheels are removed and strapped below the chassis.
There's an interesting point about the width of the Windrower's hubs. The widest load you can have on a road in the U.S. without a pilot car is 12 feet. For this reason, the Heston engineers have designed the hubs on the Windrowers to be exactly 11 feet 11 inches wide.